Hello and welcome to the Business of the Business Podcast. I'm your co-host, J.P. John Paz from the Two Man Power Trip. Of course, joining me is the financial wrestling genius himself, Lavi Margolin. Lavi, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing good, John. You know, the weather is really hot. Um, as we're recording this, there's the presidential debate going on. So looking forward to, uh, to catching up on that, some Trump mania. Um, and this week was unique because I went to two uh, pretty famous venues in New York. And as far as I know, neither has uh, has ever held uh, pro wrestling. Um, Lincoln Center and Radio City Music Hall. I think um, years ago there was like a, a special one-off where Roy Jones Jr. boxed in Radio City, just like like a cool visual. But I don't think either has ever had pro wrestling. Oh, that's actually a nice little landing spot for somebody. Those would be awesome wrestling venues, I think. Yeah, I probably gave them a laugh at Lincoln Center because they have like a follow-up, you know, survey. So I was like, I'll take it. And they're like, what other types of events would you like to see here? I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> pro wrestling. Yes, pro wrestling. Hell yeah. Now, interestingly enough, it seems like TKO is doing something as far as venue that is pretty damn interesting. What's going on with uh, TKO? So as, you know, as has been discussed for, you know, quite a while and, and our friend and former guest of the show, Zach Arnold, has been on top of this for a long time. It's sort of the reframing both UFC and WWE, so under TKO and Ari Emanuel, is to really think of them as government contractors. And we're really starting to see that um, a or foreign government. So UFC, of course, everyone's kind of laughing because they have an event they sold um, to Saudi Arabia, Riyadh CS, in which WWE, um, I think, had like a sort of like a WWE type interactive experience last year for Riyadh season. But this is taking place in Vegas. It's called Riyadh season Noche UFC. So uh, Mexican themed <laughs> as well. But, you know, they're making money by... Um, by selling the event or getting sponsorship from Saudi Arabia. And of course, WWE um, announced the big deal with Indianapolis. So it's just something like, you know, as the industry leader, really like to take note of how this model has shifted so much that it's sort of like, you know, you hear about with the NFL more with like the Super Bowl, but WWE, all the ple events and even we're starting to see like deals wh which is an unexpected where they're tying in like wwe and ufc what was it anaheim or whatever it may be like in the same weekend or a guarantee of uh, a certain amount of shows and so on so it's really becoming less of like certainly the ratings we're not going to be focused so much on ratings soon especially with raw i think there will be ratings available depending on what Amazon wants to share what's being measured, but um, the model has really changed to one thing that we knew for a long time, which is the television rights and, and streaming or whatever it may be. But also now, you know, who can get these deals with um, with governments? I mean, we've seen it in a different way in sports where, you know, <laughs> going back all the way to the Dodgers, right? Like what... Um, you know, what city will be best, you know, what what deals can you get, you know, the best to uh, to keep us there. But the change feels so, even though, like, there was that WrestleMania element for a while, basically ever since, I think it was a, I'm not sure if it was reversed, right, a WWE employee went to the work, work for Orlando or somebody that had worked for Orlando went to work for WWE. I think it's the latter. And then they started this, bidding process maybe 15 years ago but now it's just become like such a big part of what they do very interesting kind of what they're doing just as far as wb and ufc and tko and to the you know the business model that they're doing what about nxt do you do you see anything going on differently with nxt so the thing that i'm just thinking about and just having a John, I'd love to see what you think. Like, okay, so CW, we know it's an over-the-air network, right? Um, some of their affiliates now, since it's been quite weak for a while, like some of their affiliates aren't very strong across the country, even though it's over-the-air. I don't want to misspeak and say some are like digital nets, but 
some are fairly weak at the moment. So I just put out like a survey, like for the first week of NXT debuting on the CW, I believe October 1st, it's definitely October. Um, you know, what would the ratings prediction? So, you know, not again, not a, um, uh, you know, an all-inclusive survey, 40 people answer, but it gives us a little bit of a taste of what people are thinking. Um, so there are four choices, less than 700K for the debut, 27.5%, 700 to 849K, 35%, 850 to 999K, 30%, 1 million or over 7.5%. My prediction is actually just above a million because, you know, if you remember, like, how WWE loaded up like ECW when it premiered on Sci-Fi, and then they sort of like let it die, right? Like, and then you know, like you have all these things. So I think they'll have like uh, the Undertaker is coming to NXT, right. um, Stone Cold Steve Austin. Like you really you hype it up with with the legends, Hulk Hogan, whatever, whoever that they have good relationships with at that time, uh, and then it'll like it'll probably drop off and, and settle even maybe less than 700. What do you think? I I don't know. I was thinking less than 700 just because of kind of the current trend of, you know, what, what they've been doing and, and where they, I know obviously minus the sexy red stuff and like kind of pumping up the, uh, the ratings for a few weeks there, but I don't know. I'm thinking on under 700,000. That's just my guess. I'm hoping it's more though. I'm, I'm really hoping that they do well. Yeah. I feel like, like, you're right. Like, I think that's where they'll like settle in because, you know, it'll always be their third brand. But I think that first week, because they really want to announce, like, most watched CW show in seven years. You know, something like that. That's a big win for them. So they'll do whatever they need to do within reason to make that happen. Yes, true, true. They could they could go all out, if you will. And we'll, we'll see, you know, who's on the show. But as far as... Nick Khan is concerned. What else is he up to? I feel like he's up to something. So our friend uh, at John Wall Street um, had uh, an interesting announcement today that they secured, um, you know, a lot of funding. I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but they've secured lots of investments and they're growing as a brand and, uh, you know, awesome resource, awesome guest on the show. And who was one of their investors? We've been talking about how quiet he's been, you know, in the public. But as an investor, it's not WWE isn't investing in John Wall Street, but WWE president Nick Khan is one of the investors now into John Wall Street. So um, I think, uh, you know, I, I'm sure um, that they'll continue to maintain their journalistic integrity and research integrity at, when analyzing WWE. But certainly when you have somebody that, you know, is a major player at a company that you analyze from time to time, you know, it's just something to think about in the future. Now, as far as wow is concerned, what is going on with wow? I feel like they're loading up on shows or am I crazy? Or are they not loading up on shows? So, right. So I, I kind of wrote it in a way that was like a little bit cryptic on, on Twitter or X, <laughs> meaning that I was, yeah. just, <laughs> I was just sort of putting things together without saying that, will there be a season three? Is the show canceled? Because I don't want to like, you know, be the, the original source of, of such speculation, although we're talking about it now. But again, I'm not saying it's happening. I'm just speculating. So as far as I gather... This week, or maybe even last week, um, the episode was titled New Predators. So they haven't done, as far as I see here on Nike, um, they haven't done a taping in L.A. since the end of December. And, you know, they did multiple oh, wow. taping, multiple days of tapings, which they usually do. And that's the last thing on the docket. So... I believe um, I couldn't find it in my email, so maybe I'm misremembering it. And John, you're always the source that gets it to me. On August 10th last year, they sort of had the details of season two, which is the season that they're in. But I feel like they announced a renewal earlier than that. So within a couple months, regardless, we'll know because you know they'll have uh, 
if they do have a new season in September. But the show, as far as I remember, is supposed to be 52 weeks or thereabouts of, of new ongoing programming where they don't take a, a break. I mean, they can always, um, you know, do uh, best ofs or like different spotlights. Maybe they have some, uh, you know, matches on air in the can and, and things like that. It's so hard to know because they don't really deal that much with uh, pro wrestling media and no one's really following it as not necessarily as closely as us, but like from, from this perspective um, as us. So it's just something to note because uh, we haven't gotten the ratings. Um, I don't believe Brandon Thurston has gotten them to share in a while, but the ratings, when we last saw them several months ago, they were, you know, in terms of the AEW um, second and, and third, you know, show ratings, they're very competitive with that and uh, may even be surpassing it now in the ratings, depending on how things shook out. So just curious, like for some people, WoW can be gone from the schedule and, and they wouldn't notice at all. But when you're looking closely, especially as like um, from viewership over the year, programming syndication you know they have an interesting role uh to play now something that i've been dying to talk to you about something very very interesting what the heck is going on with mlw because i see all these head of production all this upgrades coming obviously you know our buddy david marquez and, and you know and others getting these big promotions but what is like what are they being promoted to do they really have tv deals like where are they being seen and and are these upgrades that are coming like are there more upgrades as far as what's going to happen with the tv programming john i'm thinking the same thing we should both be wearing the spider-man costume and you know <laughs> pointing at each other yes <laughs> because you're right i have a number of news pieces and, and you've shared a number of them with me um in preparation for the show but that's that's my question right so they they won this lawsuit they seem to be like really saving money, you know, up to that point. But like the context of what they're doing, like where do they go from here? Um, right. They now they shifted away from um, Triller Fight Plus, um, formerly named Fight Plus, to now having uh, MLW pay-per-views or whatever they call them, premium live events on YouTube. So they're always like, like sometimes they'll be like, okay, I, I remember this over a course of years where we're, we're off YouTube, we're going off YouTube soon. Now we're back on YouTube. They have um, a deal with BN and BN Sports Espanol, which, you know, has always been reported as having been paid, even as that platform loses its distribution. But since um, the... Middle Eastern money behind it, and it's a bigger platform in that region, in the Middle East, even though MLW is on there, they sort of have leeway to keep going in the U.S., even though, um, you know, their, you know, exposure is shrinking as a, as a platform, but they do have be in sports as a digital network, so that uh, depending on how many people get it or look for it, you know, that gives them more coverage, but I don't know where an MLW goes from here, right? Like, can they get another TV deal, a bigger streaming deal? Um, they've done well in international, but, you know, being on uh, Wata and station in Poland, um, and then uh forgot if it's the Star Times, one of those that has many... Um, you know, many countries in Africa. So is there more money to be made there? So I don't know, but they have this and they're starting to, to spend it again. So two big announcements and kudos to them. I mean, you know, who's, I mean, who's more professional and knowledgeable than these people in their, their field. I mean, you can argue, but, uh, but you know, no one would debate, you know, that they're top notch for their field, certainly. So one of which is uh, Dave Marquette, had been working with them. Um, I don't know if it was as a freelance or maybe sometimes he did, sometimes he didn't, but this seems like a, a full-time commitment from what I gather. I don't know if it's considered full-time employment, but this is a uh, you know, very formal role to that. Um, I don't think it would affect his work with you know his 
and the brands are Championship Wrestling from Florida, United Wrestling Network. But um, and oddly, they sent out two press releases within like what was it, an hour of each other? Why not mm-hmm. combine the two? Um, so, uh, Major League Wrestling announced the appointment of Dave Marquez as the new head of production with decades of production experience in life for wrestling and sports. Two time Emmy winner brings an industry his innovative approach and commitment to excellence have earned him a stellar reputation we are thrilled to bring david to lead our production operations as we embark on an exciting new future bauer said his wealth of experience and creative insight will elevate our production quality enhancing the overall experience for our fans and presentation of our fighters and their journeys in the squared circle david will play a key role in catapulting mlw's growth in the media landscape. Marquez will oversee all aspects of production, including all live event, post-production, pre- and post-shows, and overall production operations. His strategic vision aims to enhance the storytelling and visual presentation of MLW, ensuring that every event is a major league experience for fans worldwide. I'm excited to take the helm of production ops at MLW. I look forward to the opportunity to work every day with our incredible talent in front of the camera, an amazing production operations group, behind it to make sure MLW is a first-class production. So next, um, David Sahadi, an award-winning figure in the world of professional wrestling, has joined the company. So just as an aside, we had been talking about um, his cutback from uh, um, TNA recently. Sahadi brings over three decades of experience, having previously worked with industry giants such as WWE and Impact Wrestling. Was that a microaggression, right? They didn't call it TNA. Uh, Known for the vision visionary storytelling and innovative production techniques sahadi is expected to elevate mlw's presentation to new heights david sahadi is the creative force behind some of the most iconic production and marketing in wrestling david has redefined hype for promotions talent and their stories giving us all goosebumps or if you read the um bob Backlund book uh goose pimples in this in his presentation his unparalleled expertise and creative genius will be instrumental in shaping the future of mlw we are excited to see the new heights of our content will reach with David at the helm. So how he expressed his enthusiasm for the new role saying, joining MLW is an incredible opportunity. The passion and potential within this company are unmatched. I look forward to bringing new, my experience and creativity to help MLW grow and captivate audiences around the world. So again, not to, What are they going to do, you know, in terms of what they have to work with and in the competitive environment? So sometimes it might be throwing good money, not after bad isn't the right term here, but like throwing good money in a way that it's just hard to capitalize. I'd love to be proven wrong to see uh, things grow there. Um, But, you know, in terms of their schedule upcoming, um, that we're aware of so far. St. Petersburg, they'll be doing Blood and Thunder, which we'll get back to in a moment, and a TV taping. In New York on August 29th, Summer of the Beast in Queens. In Atlanta, where they did very well last time, uh, and September 14th. And then back to Cicero on November 9th, um, Lucha Apocalypse. So, um, John, I don't know if you've been following their creative. I wasn't aware of it till this time. So Selena De La Renta is pregnant, and, and that's a shoot uh, in real life. She's she's pregnant, and, and we wish yeah. her well. You know, congrats. Um, but this has become a, a storyline that, you know, maybe from one perspective seems quite silly or I like this to go as far as offensive, you know, it is pro wrestling, but uh, who is Selena's baby daddy? It will be revealed in, in St. Petersburg. So it's kind of like, maybe we were talking about them leaning into like Lucha. So maybe, you know, this is sort of like a telenovela, like somebody wouldn't look the other way if there's like a, a soap opera and they're like, who is the father of the baby? You know, so right. maybe that's yep. the type of audience that they're looking for to distinguish themselves from the, somebody on the outside looking in. It seems kind of weird. And Selena Del Rente is such a talented performer. Like, you know, I'm sure she maybe she even conceptualized this idea, but it just seems like 
I don't know, like degrading, I guess, at this point. And like, saying, like, if I was good, you know, uh, maybe, um, you know, if they're Googling themselves later, mom, like I was in a, a storyline. It's a little silly, but people can have fun with that. Maybe it'll be like a, a Dominic thing. We can look back in, in 25 years and like yeah. you have the origin story. The earliest the performer has appeared on uh, on TV as a baby bump. Um, but Blood and Thunder, um, the you know, it's hard to tell how many tickets were originally opened, but it looks like some patterns that um, what I could say positively is that most of the tickets that were put on sale look like they were um, distributed. Tell me all about New Japan Pro Wrestling and even throw in AEW Forbidden Door in there. I want to see how they're going ticket sales wise. Yes, so New Japan is is running uh, an angle of stardom. Who is the fa- No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, so New Japan Capital Collision. Um, on uh, August 30th, so we were waiting for tickets to go on sale. Um, so as of June 25th, so um, a couple of days ago as we are recording this, less than a 1,000 tickets were sold, 924 in a setup of 2,778. So we'll see, like, right, uh, New Japan isn't running too many shows in the U.S. Um, that seems like a good strategy. This tends to be one of their ten pole events. I don't think that they've announced many talents or matchups yet, so things tend to pick up from there. Um, it's a uh, a decent start, but tickets aren't moving that quickly. Sixty three were moved in the last seven days, so two months uh, two months out from that. Um, Forbidden Door. It's um, you know it's a growing and uh, moving number here. Um, they're over 9,000, maybe over 9,100, um, which is really good pickup, um, you know, for them. I think they might finish as we, um, according this a couple of days out, I think they might finish around 10,000 tickets. So I was just thinking about this, John. Um, SmackDown looks like, looks like they opened up more tickets and they're in the position maybe to sell about 17,000. Yep. Um, just because they've moved so many today. And let's say AEW a- and New Japan, um, I kind of see it as a W show, but like with New Japan as a uh, sort of a spark and, and intrigue um, to the show is can move 10,000 tickets. And although it's in Long Island, Belmont Park, I kind of consider it closer to like the New York City market just because, for example, from Grand Central Station, on the uh, for those not familiar, uh, on the east side of Manhattan, Forty Second Street, you can take um, a train just directly there. It's it's easy to uh, to get to. So it's not like sometimes there's something way out there in uh, Long Island or forgive my geography, John. Sometimes certain things, in, depending where it is, New Jersey, seem way out there, and sometimes it's conflated as like the New York City market. But like if somebody's in one place, they would never go another. Not to say that everyone that would go to Madison Square Garden would go out to Belmont, but um, but it's pretty much the same market. So really impressive to see, on, not unprecedented, but on a Friday night, you get 17,000 in the garden, and that should be um, multi-million dollar might be, um, you know, saying too much, but, you know, more than a million dollar gate in itself, I'd assume. And we're hearing AEW is going to do over a million as well. So sort of both promotions at their best, certainly AEW using one of their strongest tools, but it's a good thing to see. Um, But a little bit of uh, something from uh, some sage wisdom, I would say from Masahiro Chono who said that New Japan should focus on gaining market share in Asia rather than focusing on America because AEW and WWE are deep-pocketed black ships. So I think sage advice, like I mentioned, but um, the way to think about it is not necessarily becoming, certainly not becoming number one. Uh, There was the opportunity at a lower level to become number two a few years ago for a little bit they kind of flirted with it um uh back when they were rocking and rolling with ring of honor and, and impact was really down and there was no AEW yet 
Um, but, you know, if they can make some money from internationally, so we'd have to assume they're getting a, a rights fee from Access, that they get uh, a fee from AEW or a percentage of the gate in this investment, in this co-branded show. And if they're making money from these four to five shows that they're doing, then that that's all good. Um, somebody named Annoying Ben <laughs> uh, at Knox Ben One on X had sort of replied that this also applies the other way because WWE and AEW will never gain a permanent foothold in Japan because they'll always be seen as outsiders. But for WWE, there is a lot of potential money to be made just coming in like as as that, you know, rock show where you want to see the the international stars a couple times a year also working with abima now there's the opportunities to send talent to the promotions under their guise and and make money in different ways so it just sort of depends on what your expectations is if you're going to a market to be number one and you're not based there no it's it's not likely that you'll be number one but certainly if there's money to be made you just have to think about the opportunity cost between doing that and uh, not doing something else. Just going back to the MSG WB show. Very interesting. So last year, this around, you know, around this time, the MSG summer show, if you will, sold about 13,600 tickets. So that's what they put on sale. So that number got beat. So then they put out 15,000 tickets. That number got hit. So then they put out 17,000. So now it's at 16, I think it's 17,500 or something. It's at 16,700. So it's funny. They keep moving the goalpost and WB keeps inching closer. So I don't know if it'll technically be a sellout but i guess it is a sellout because it sold out twice before that technically crazy yeah no it's interesting to like look back on it with um you know when raw became like a big set which is like 97 mm -hmm. um or, or thereabouts because originally they were struggling and it gave the opportunity to be in the major arenas and then you cut off you know 30 percent of it yeah. but when they got hot, they still kept that cutoff and, you know, they were selling out shows and really that was money left on the table. So smartly now they could say like, we have our regular SmackDown set up, uh, but also when there's the opportunity, like the day off, well, that would be raw, but you know, when there's a day after WrestleMania, or maybe if SmackDown is being taped in the, in the market and there's the opportunity to sell that out in advance for the Hall of Fame, um, special shows like um, MSG or whatever, where it gets hot, um, then why cut off so much uh, ticket sales potential? Um, and the prices are just so much more now that yeah. although live events was becoming, and, and we're talking about it, right? Like as, as the first topic here, that government contracts and, and um, rights fees are the major drivers now, but there's the opportunity with the type of tickets uh, prices that they're charging to make a lot of money in the right venues in the right type of shows. And SmackDown MSG, it's a cool thing, but it's still just a SmackDown. So, um, you know, seems like a really good opportunity for them. Like I talked about, although it was a negative experience for me, the show in Barclays before, um wrestlemania i paid so much money for like a horrible uh seat um you know they're 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 catching up it used to be like pro wrestling like for years and years at the garden right 25 dollars could get you a great seat <laughs> and then suddenly somebody realized oh you know let's try let's see if we can uh make more and and, and it seemed to work out really well for them now, as far as TNA is concerned, what's the latest on TNA wrestling? So they have these shows at the 2300 Arena, but I don't know if uh, if anyone is, is talking much about them. Is Are any of your buddies going to these shows? I will be going, actually, Saturday night. The uh, Me and my buddy will be going, the second show. Oh, nice. Okay. Okay, now actually, now that reminds me, I had asked you already for a head count. So, um, yes. so I'd love to learn, like, if they're you know, if they shifted around because MLW, and I don't know for sure what you know, what's accurate or not, 
they were claiming sellouts at 2300, but it seemed like they were just shifting people around and using like um, less seats and like uh, three out of the four spots. Um, as far as I can tell, I grabbed the first night map. Um, it looks like just the first three to four rows, depending on the, the quartile, uh, were put for sale because there's plenty of seats either after that or um, or it looks like they weren't put on sale, um, you know, at all. So really curious for your uh, on the ground uh, report. Now, Slammiversary, <laughs> it's one of those that keeps getting this complexity where, and again, like last week, I admitted to, let's say starting the problem, but being one of the early people that sort of like captured a screen grab once they expanded the seats. And I was like, oh, they're, they sold out the reserved seats and we're good. But then you see that, you know, a lot of the reserved are, are still available that were put on sale later. So, but um, various reports come out of uh, how many tickets were sold. So there's something reporting that PCO had, had sent them a message, or actually we had a screen grab, or it's 2,000. Then Matt Hardy's podcast, um, there was claims that it was 2,300. Then somebody had posted that there were 2,500 tickets sold. So, um, but uh, we'll see. But smartly, they're going for um, one of their two hometown stars to be in a significant position where Mike Bailey will be challenging uh, Mustafa Ali for uh, for Mustafa's uh, title. So that should appeal. I know I don't watch TNA, but as far as I can gather, PCO is in a uh, an angle with uh, Steph Delander. I think he went on a date with her, or something like that, on the show. Um, I don't know, you know, what this leads to in terms of a match or his uh, significant interest. He is, um, I think, he's fifty six. So, but I'd love to see him, you know, in a in a significant role, as significant a role as possible, if it makes sense. Um, but in terms of their upcoming shows, like we talked about, um, June 28th and 29th in Philly, um, Slammiversary and a taping in the Montreal uh, on J July 20th and 21st, Tampa on August 2nd and 3rd, Louisville on August 30th and 31st, Cleveland on September 13th, my birthday, <laughs> and then another taping on the 14th. And then, of course, uh, tickets are not yet on sale, but they announced Spartanburg on September 27th and 28th. Uh, I think last time I didn't have the venue in front of me. Of course, it's at the Spartanburg Memorial Auditorium. Um, depending on PR and, and so on, um, you know, they could get some momentum with, with the Hardys if sort of make it a homecoming. I'm not sure when the last time was that the Hardys had uh, had a significant role together in the Carolinas. Now, as far as GCW is concerned, they've got a bunch of shows coming up, right? They got a ton of yeah, shows. Yeah, so, so there was a, a brief uh, respite there. Um, but, uh, they're going to Texas, um, Houston, um, Zillow's, um, uh, sort of homecoming, I guess he, he does, you know, he has wrestled or he will wrestle again for reality of wrestling, but sort of a homecoming under the GCW banner. So just a few rows of, uh, tickets were on sale and then stage seating, which is sold out. So just general admission is currently available. And then in Dallas, um, it looks like they didn't do as well. Um, a different size venues. Dallas is actually a lot larger. Um, the third row ringside still has, um, well, fourth row, interestingly, just has five tickets available, even though there's the same price. Sometimes you'll get those aberrations. Um, and of course, general admission. So a plenty of shows on the books. So just going to go through that uh, quickly. Um, Backyard Wrestling 6, Time Flies, on July 4th. They used to keep it in Jersey um, or, or broadcast it from Jersey, but now it could be from potentially anywhere. The next day, they'll be in uh, Toronto. Um, and then uh, two days later in Montreal, the team up with IWS. 
then um, July 18th in Louisville, July 19th in Saugat, Illinois, July 20th in Indianapolis. So a another uh, triple shot for them. Um, on July 28th, Bloodsport. Um, that's something that uh, in Brooklyn that I'm really looking forward to. So I can give the on the ground report on that one. Uh, Cleveland on August 2nd, um, August 4th in Asbury Park. That was the one you were considering, John. Does that seem still possible for you? Yes, for sure. Cool. Um, then a triple shot, of course, if you're going all the way out to Japan, teaming up with DDT um, the first night and then two nights on their own in a different venue that holds about 650. Um Back to LA on August 17th, their debut in Salt Lake City on, sorry, that's um, August 17th is LA, August 18th is the debut in Salt Lake City. Um, then uh, August 24th and 25th is the homecoming weekend, their final big shows uh, for the season in Atlantic City, the summer season. Chicago, they're back to Talia Hall on August 31st, then a, a um, back to um, Harpo's in Detroit on September 14th, Rochester on the 15th. Um, the geography of that, I don't know how, how close those two are. I'll, I'll have to look it up a uh, different time. And then of course, Honolulu uh, announced well in advance. So there'll be a lot to fill in between those um, on, uh, the November the 2nd. What is going on with the NWA? And please, if you can, mention ICP along with NWA. So um, uh, NWA was wishing well to ICP and Violent J, who we had talked about their promotion. Now, um, Sorry, John. Um, Morton, Morton the Sun. What? What's his name? Kerry. Kerry. Sorry. Apologies, Kerry, if, if you're listening. Um, Kerry um, actually works for both promotions, so this may have been Kerry uh, tweeting this. Uh, I'm sure with permission, um, but uh, we know that they have the um, a good relationship anyway because ICP has worked for NWA and so on. But you know that gives a little bit of the backstory. Um, I enjoyed having an eye on Billy Corgan and NWA. We're both rock stars running healthy promotions on rock star money. We're friends. JCW has had lots of success and we're looking forward to bringing it back by Lin J. So interesting thing to see what they could do there. I don't imagine um, Jugaloo uh, Championship Wrestling becoming an NWA affiliate, but stranger things have happened. I'm sure they'll work together in, in different capacities where it makes sense. So not too much else going on that's new at the NWA at the moment, but um, you know, each of their um, territories or uh, the main promotion, you know, has something cooking. So just looking at it quickly, Exodus Pro recently held a show, of course, in Cleveland, NWA, Chicago, Endless Summer. So Corgan's uh, sort of own territory besides owning the main thing on uh, June 28th. So that might take place by the time you hear this. Crossfire uh, in Newport, um, Tennessee, taking place on that same night. NWA 76, August 31st in Philly. Uh, NWA Samhain 2, October 26th in Sarasota. And then of course the long talked about return to Dothan on December uh, 14th. As far as Freddie Prince Jr. is concerned, what is the latest on him? Because I almost feel like we heard the same exact thing last year and a year and a half ago. It seems like almost the same thing over and over again. What's going on with Freddie? Yeah, I don't know if he needs time to fill his uh, podcast in the air with like intrigue about his promotion. At first, I was really excited, and I was actually using some uh, of my connections to try and connect with Freddie and like <laughs> and pitch myself to to help out. So not sour grapes because I didn't connect with him, but people don't negotiate. You know, like as far as I know, and I'd love to to see something come of it. But people don't negotiate when you're close, like in public. Like this. I guess Tony Khan does it a lot with uh, Warner Brothers Discovery, but he's 
but they already have the relationship. But like talk about that, it's close and and whatever every week. It seems like it's just not going to happen. So he has revealed that he's been in talks with the company, but if they reach a deal, the aforementioned company will have to restructure. Despite this claim, Prince asserts that the company is still alive, but didn't reveal the name of who he's been dealing with. If they even pick this up, how long they'd be in business for it. So it might not be a great fit. I don't know, which that makes me nervous. My wife took a meeting at a place. They were pitching her a show that they want her to produce. And they mentioned wrestling and asked if I was still involved in the wrestling business. Prince then added that the meeting took place and further described them as a well-established company. He noted that by the time the episode comes out, things might have been confirmed or denied during the production period. So hopefully by next week's episode, I'll be able to give you guys some good news or some terrible news. I think you should just like stop. Yeah, <laughs> it's getting out of control now. Yeah, but hey, uh, speaking of maybe out of control, what's going on with SGW? They've uh, they've got crazy stuff going on over there. Yeah, soft ground wrestling. So, uh, sort of like the darling of the internet. How could you not love them? Like as they describe themselves, like orphans, and they're um, wrestling on soft ground, right? The dirt or makeshift yep. ring, and kind of yep. know what they're doing. Not really. Um, but, uh, you know, they had this angle and, uh, not to offend anyone cause it's not my own faith, but people were intrigued by that. Like that they killed somebody that was sort of like, a, a stand in for Jesus Christ. And then he rose from the dead and, you know, all this sort of stuff. And people were like, yeah, that, you know, if they weren't offended, they were intrigued. Okay. You know, they're, they're being creative here, but now, oh, I don't know, John, did you see the video that So you, you cut off is, you cut um, off for a second there. Oh oh sure. John, I was just curious if you had seen this video yet. No, I hadn't seen it yet. Not yet. Okay. So I don't necessarily recommend it, but uh it's titled us uh, SGW Orphan Wrestler Trevor Accused of Child Neglect. Uh so there's a woman in the ring and, and holding a baby, and then they say like it must be theirs, they look like each other, whatever whatever it may be. They're like kind of like yelling. And then um, this guy grabs the kid and he's like holding them up by their leg and like sort of like, I don't know if I go so far as saying swinging, but like moving them around the ring. And the kid is like freaking out. They've not, you know, they're not like in on the act or anything like that. So it's like very uncomfortable to watch. So kind of enjoyed them as this like fascination, but we also have to acknowledge that they don't necessarily know what the hell they're doing over there. Yeah. And you know, they're sort of like on a razor's edge, like at least from intrigue from like a, a North American audience, like what will they do next? That will be, uh, you know, a very offensive, you know, um, that things like related to religion that, you know, seem more like relevant to their own culture and some of the um, tensions there that you know, you're sort of like a, I don't know. I don't understand exactly what's going on here, but curious to curious to watch. I mean, in the at the end of the day, does it matter? I don't know. I mean, keeping the keeping it light and like getting pro wrestlers to donate money. Um, although I haven't seen a ring yet appear, even though two wrestlers had seemingly donated money, like it gives me questions. Uh, you know, about the promotion and how things are running. So hopefully we'll see a ring sometime soon, but maybe not go away from the soft ground because that's their name and part of the intrigue. But uh, I think there'll be one day a story to tell. I have no idea what that story is from A to Z, but, but I think there will be a story to tell. I don't think it'll continue exactly as it is with this intrigue and engagement of the American audience. I think something will happen one way or another. What's up with YouTube TV? Are they uh, doing anything wrestling related or what's going on with YouTube TV? Not really yet, but it's always curious to see like what's going on, right? As we see like MLW returning to YouTube, uh, not like equating this to this story, but like, you know, they're 
<laughs> the biggest platform for watching videos online. So you always kind of want to see what they're doing. YouTube was the top streaming service in the U.S. each month of 2023 and continues to become the biggest presence in the lives of sports fans after it acquires NFL Sunday Ticket. But YouTube isn't stopping there. YouTube Global Sports Partnership. John Cruz joined the Stream Time podcast to discuss. What we're trying to do at YouTube is build optionally op optionality for our partners. It's very important for us to make sure that we have all the content, sports or otherwise, that our users are looking for. In order to do that, we recognize that we're going to have to provide rights holders, broadcasters for different business models, be it ad supported, be it subscriptions. Be it with Sunday Ticket, YouTube worked closely with the NFL to develop a YouTube exclusive content and developed a new look um, product for the service that they felt more recognizable to digital video consumers. So um, just in the uh, interest of time, I'm going to, you know, have people look that up, but just to show that um, YouTube isn't ignoring the sports rights fees and to have more players in the market means more opportunities. And obviously pro wrestling is a, uh, is a big thing, um, you know, on, on YouTube. So curious to see if, if something more comes of that, but also a reminder that uh, TNA just moved away from, from YouTube as a major part of their uh, brand strategy. Very, very interesting. Now I know you have a bunch of stuff list, listed under other, including limitless wrestling, but what, what is other, what, what else is going on in this crazy wrestling world? Yeah, so just as we were talking about this cool thing going on with the Coliseum and Limitless Wrestling and how maybe they could build this ongoing relationship. So obviously the show will come across in August, no problem. But lo and behold, now the Coliseum is for sale. Um, they're trying to get almost $5 million for it. Um, so, you know, when you have a change in uh, potential change in ownership, you had this person that works for the policy reach out to Limitless and want to host wrestling. You know, uh, those type of things can change as, as that changes as well. So that's one story. The next, and this came out of nowhere for me, I wasn't familiar with Winnipeg Pro Wrestling, but apparently they've been doing this Rumble in the Burt show for a while at the Burton Cummings Theater in Winnipeg. And, um, you know, it could set, they have it set up for. 1,245 and they've sold about 800 tickets in advance of a show that's October. So I'm not sure if they regularly show, sell this show out, but um, I really want to learn more about this promotion. Um, so uh, something that we don't talk about as much anymore is that, um, you know, First Wrestling has continued this relationship with the Mall of America. For the third year, Saturday Night Nitro is returning to the Mall of America, giving guests a chance to see wrestling action in person america uh, they'll host um i just wanted to give a little insight from okay so this is the part that was most intriguing to me originally we wanted to pay homage to wcw by bringing wrestling back to the mall of america said chris grab vp of experiential at mall of america what first wrestling delivered to their fans has far exceeded that initial vision making it one of the biggest events of the year it's a night of top tier talent full of surprises that's not to be missed so curious like you know that's a good thing that they delighted um mall of america and they kind of create their own thing rather than a nostalgia show so although it wasn't planned there's was interesting news that came out by the same people that own the mall of america they also own american dreams mall and they um picked up arena football they're actually going to have the uh championship game there oh nice i like that Nice. Yeah, I think the uh, I've never been to American Dreams, but I really like what they're doing on the sports side. It seems like they have a, a section that they've used for maybe professional women's ice hockey. Um, and it's something that they could convert to arena football or whatever it is. So uh, it made me think about like a residency or taping for pro wrestling. Um, I think like, yes, local pro wrestling and our friends like Crowbar and so on would be would be appealing to one degree, but you know, for like a TNA that you know, I know that they're thinking about scaling up their venues in the future or whatever. But uh, in terms of the way they do business, or even something like a Ring of Honor, um, you know, under Tony Khan, like it could be like an intriguing thing to tape a few shows there. I think for TNA, it kind of limits it, like I've talked about, by the name, right? You're pitching them and it's okay. It'll be fun family entertainment. People will drop in and watch for wrestling. It's sort of like, you're called what now? So um, 
I have a, an interesting connection. My uh, parents were actually friends with the Garmazians who uh, own these these malls. Um, they used to uh, live in the same apartment building or, you know, <laughs> large apartment complex. And um, uh, and they would invite them over for uh, for meals. So very nice family. I've never met them, but uh but they treated my parents uh, very nicely who are elderly and, and needed um, assistance uh, even at that time. So uh, support the malls, y'all. Nice. And final thing, uh, Georgia, Georgia wrestling. So um, a really uh, interesting article uh, dropped by Cal Steed called Georgia professional wrestling is on another level. So, um, Maybe I will pick up a, uh, a snippet of it to give you a taste, but it really is insightful, um, you know, for sort of on the ground uh, from there. So um, he attended a show in Royston, Georgia, which uh, there all of the time when I was trying to track independent pro wrestling, there was always the results for those shows. Um, so, Royston, okay, so on the way, every time we drive through Royston, there's a sign that always catches my attention, live pro wrestling. I've been telling Serene for years I'm going to one of those shows. So knowing we were coming to Georgia back in April, I looked on Facebook and found out that Anarchy Wrestling was hosting Hardcore Hell 26 at the Royston Dome on June 22nd. I purchased a ticket, and then last Saturday night ventured over to Royston to check out my first ever independent wrestling show. It was everything I expected and more. Over 200-plus fans packed the Royston Dome. Um, so it's an old high school gym built in the 1940s. You could smell the history and grit the minute you walk in the door. Wood panels for a roof. No air conditioning. This is my kind of place. Just that real wrestling feel. Being a veteran sports reporter, I couldn't just sit back and enjoy the show as a fan. I'm intrigued and love to ask questions. I started chatting up the locals and was fortunate to sit down with the promoter, owner of the Royston Dome, James Boulevard, and his business partner, John Feltner. I was able to chat with Georgia. Okay, so actually that's really interesting that they own the venue and that's why they're able to run it so much. So it's a really uh, detailed, extensive article. So I suggest that everyone uh, look it up. I love it. Love it. We had a lot of news to cover this week. A lot of good stuff. Hopefully Freddie Prince gets his act together and we get something from him, but let's hit the plugs. You follow me on Twitter and Instagram at two man power trip. Lavi, where can we find you and follow you? You're, Oh, you're on mute right now. Lavi. Sorry about that. Uh, follow me on X, Lavi Marg, L A V I E M A R G. Check out my long form articles on linecubjobsearch.com. Um, join our group, The Business of the Business, on LinkedIn. Um, we are the official business podcast of PW Ponderings, and we are distributed by the Creative Control Network. And um, give me some feedback on uh, my lighting tonight. Uh, it seemed a little bit dark, but uh, it seems to be working. I don't know. I might go for it in the future. I like it. I like it a lot, Lavi. Thank you to Lavi. Thank you, everybody out there for listening. See you right back here next week for a little business of the business. We'll see you next week, folks.